HD 2D graphics using Unreal Engine got popularized by Square Enix and Acquire through the Octopath Traveler series which had its first release in 2018. Even though the term HD 2D is trademarked, we can all take inspiration from this art style and apply it to our own games. In this video I'll break down the essential steps to achieve this HD 2D look. There are a couple of Japanese speeches and interviews from the dev team of Octopath Traveler, which I will summarize and on top of that give some more concrete advice on how to implement these things in Unreal Engine. But I also do have a full 17 hour course that will take you through all of the steps of creating 3 different 2D top down games in Unreal, with the last one being a 2D 3D hybrid utilizing a lot of these techniques. So please check it out from the discount link in the description. Let's get right into it. The first point is quite obvious, but the most important. And of course you'll need to use pixel art characters. When Square Enix approached Acquire for Octopath, the requirement was to use 2D characters in a 3D world to mix nostalgic pixel art with modern rendering techniques, and Acquire had to figure out how to achieve that. With Unreal Engine, we can make use of Paper 2D which is the built-in framework for sprite animations, and we can just import sprite sheets, turn them into flipbooks, and then apply those flipbooks to a paper character based blueprint. Sprite sizes will differ per character, but as an example Cyrus is 34 pixels tall and 18 pixels wide while other characters like Olberry can be taller and wider. These characters usually feature a color palette with pretty low saturation, and this NPC for example has 6 different main colors outside of black with ramps covering 3 to 6 tones. For top down games, these characters will generally feature animations with 4 different directions covering left, right, up and down. 8 or 16 directions are also possible for smoother animations, but will drastically increase your workload. Even just 4 directions are already a lot if you have hundreds of characters and instead of drawing every frame by hand, in the case of Octopath they created a character base, attached modular clothing and used Photoshop's puppet warp functionality to create these sprite sheets. However final adjustments would still be made by hand. After your characters are in engine you need to come up with your own logic to switch these directions in the blueprint based on the character's rotation or just utilize the free paper ZD plugin which comes with a system built in for directional animations. The next most important thing are the lighting and shadows and this is where Unreal Engine really shines. By default sprites and flipbooks won't cast shadows, but this can be enabled by just ticking a box. They also don't receive shadows or lighting information and we simply have to change from the unlit sprite material to the lit sprite material to achieve that. In most cases you want to adjust the directional light that simulates the sun to hit the characters diagonally from the front, so it casts an interesting diagonal shadow. Of course you can then also place other light sources into the scene and also fake lights such as god rays. In Octopath there are also often scenes where you enter a cave and your character will hold a lamp that illuminates the environment. And this was actually one of the first things the development team prototyped still using Maya before moving into Unreal. This effect can be achieved by simply attaching a spotlight to the character and setting it to absolute rotation so it doesn't turn together with the character and will always shine at it from the front. In one of the interviews, the art director Mika Izuka mentions how just using particle effects wasn't enough and they would also spawn point lights whenever an effect would play out to also illuminate the environment. But they were also still using Unreal Engine 4, so if you were to use UE5 and Lumen, you could just play out an effect and the emissive materials will automatically illuminate the surroundings. But Lumen comes with a high performance cost and you might not want to use it. The next most important thing are the camera settings and just changing a few things here will make a huge difference. During one of the speeches, Izuka-san mentions how during the first prototype in Unreal, the scale just didn't look right and to achieve a perspective closer to retro pixel art games from the past, they angled the camera downwards and decreased the field of view setting. I found that pointing the camera downwards by 20 degrees gives us the nice top down view. For the field of view setting on the camera, something between 35 and 45 degrees gives us a similar look to Octopath and makes buildings appear more miniature like. Camera settings alone aren't quite enough to achieve this look though and we'll have to utilize post processing which is another big strength of Unreal. According to Izuka-san, they only used settings already available in Unreal Engine's post processing volume and didn't have to develop any custom effects. They made use of color grading, especially using a strong gamma effect in dungeons to make them appear darker, but color grading is something I personally am not that great with and I usually just slightly crank up the saturation and contrast or use the settings that come from maps of artists that really know what they're doing. Bloom was another setting also heavily utilized and this extends the glow of bright areas of an image, especially looking great on god rays, candles and things of that nature. Here I tend to use a bloom intensity of around 1.6 to not overdo it. Lens flare is another setting they utilized which you can also turn on with the click of a single button. And you can then play around with the settings like the bokeh size and threshold. 
But they also mentioned how lens flare can be problematic with a fixed camera game like this. And they would only apply it very lightly, so it would mostly activate during sunrises and sunsets. They also mentioned how instead of using a skylight, they use the ambient cube map post process setting to brighten up darker areas which aren't directly being hit by sunlight. Yet another setting they utilized is the vignette, which slightly darkens the edges of the screen. All you need to do for this is to change the vignette intensity setting, but you definitely don't want to overdo it. Actually, it's active by default in Unreal with a default setting of 0.4, and she mentions how they lowered this number and I think something around 0.2 looks nice. The probably most important setting to achieve this tilt shift miniature look though is depth of field, which allows you to make certain areas in your view appear more in focus, while making objects in front or behind that area blurred out. In Octopath Traveler and all other Square Enix HD 2D games, they use a bokeh depth of field, and you can still use that in Unreal Engine 4. However, since UE5, the depth of field was completely changed, and we now only have access to the cinematic depth of field, which is nice, but will look slightly different. Covering all of the settings here would take too much time, and I actually have a separate video about this. And combining all of these different post-processing effects will lead to a completely different and much more modern look. Another thing to keep in mind is the environment. As mentioned before, the characters are flat 2D sprites, but the world is made up of 3D objects with pixel art textures. An easy way to achieve a similar look without creating custom assets is to use stylized or hand-painted asset packs from the marketplace, and then reduce the max texture size to something around 256 or 128 pixels in the texture settings. This will scale down the resolution and make the textures appear more pixelated. But of course, this often doesn't look perfect, and making assets from scratch with this art style in mind will give you the best result, even if it's very time consuming. Izuka-san also mentioned how creating very low poly models similar to the PS1 era actually didn't work out that great, and resulted in inconsistent lighting. So a lot of the models in Octopath are surprisingly high poly, and even though they do use pixel art textures, they apply bilinear or trilinear filtering to smoothen the transition between colors, instead of having crisp pixel art which might look too harsh for environmental objects. But not all props are created as 3D objects, and she mentions how having some 2.5D objects, which are basically sprites that are slightly bent, creates a more cohesive look and brings the 2D and 3D elements together more nicely. The Octopath theme would also utilize Unreal Engine's landscape and foliage tools for the desert and snow environments, and made use of splines to place rivers throughout the world and dungeons. In addition, they created their own block-based building tool inside of Unreal, which is possible through custom editor tools, which every user can make. However, this requires a lot of know-how and time, and they would then use these blocks together with the landscape tool and module assets to build out their world. Buildings also play an important role, and they aren't built in a physically correct size, but rather a smaller scale that is influenced by Final Fantasy VI and supposed to invoke nostalgia. But this brings up an issue of characters not properly fitting into these buildings. To combat that, they came up with the idea of putting a trigger at the door that would make the character shrink to half the size, but also cut the camera distance in half. By instantly making this change, the character appears to be of the same size, however we now have twice the room to explore within these buildings. Another important effect is the ability to mask out objects in the foreground that would obscure the view to your character. This is something they employed in Octopath, and it's also something I cover in my courses by creating material functions and a custom material that detects the position of the camera and if objects are blocking the view. And those are the most important points from these interviews that I wanted to sum up, and these will get you very close to achieving that awesome HD 2D look. But there are a couple of more interesting details mentioned that would just take too long to cover here, and I'll link all of my sources in the description. Again, if you want to try your hand at this and learn step by step how to make 2D 3D hybrids like this by yourself, check out my 17 hour course from the discount link in the description. As always, thanks to my awesome patrons.